What are a lot of brokerages out here missing from a technology standpoint? The power in their data. CRM is just something that's in the way. It's the agents that do very, very well that know how to use the CRM systems and be able to benefit from them. Do you think that every brokerage needs a chief data officer? Absolutely. 100%. Because there's so much that can be done with technology within a brokerage yeah. that gives them that advantage, that step ahead of all the other brokerages. What do you think are like the emerging sort of trends in real estate? based on the data. So mm -hmm. COVID, we had a, a V-shaped recovery and we have done very well broken records month on month for the last three years, right? I believe 2024 is the year of What's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of The Real Ones. This week, I am joined by Lynette Sacchetto, Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me, Joel. So happy to be here. Lynette, I've got a list of things here that I cannot overlook because that's how many accolades you've got under your belt. So A, of course, founder, DXP Advisors, managing partner, Real Trust. And then we've got, wait for this, PropTech Woman Leader of the Year, Mina's Top 10 Power List. You pioneered the opening up of the land department data um, and then you were also a big part of Mo Asher, Dubai's official sales and rental performance index. And uh, you also went to Harvard. And um, you were the director of R&D at PF. And you're also an ambassador for DLD and a lot of other things. I've been so, busy. That's the whole episode, guys. <laughs> okay, let's <laughs> You've do been it. busy. <laughs> so awesome. So, you know, before we get into all the serious real estate stuff, I love to ask my guests. Uh, what did you want to become when you were seven years old? Seven? Yeah. Oh, dear. Okay, I, I was a special child. Okay. So actually, it was at seven, I remember. I was sitting at the kitchen table, yeah. and I was cutting out pieces of paper, yeah. and I was writing CEO, my name. <laughs> no way. And no joke. And then the home phone number, and I was because uh, we had an apartment building in Chicago, yeah. and I would go door to door and give it to all of the tenants to say, hey, you guys have any questions or need anything just give me a call you're kidding yes. you're kidding so you used to go around <laughs> to apartments be like hey i'm going to be ceo of this building and if you need anything let me know exactly oh my god wow yeah. i know this is how i know i'm behind on the game like you know <laughs> this is how i should have been as a child i was just drinking two packets of lacnor tetra packs a day that was like chocolate milks pretty much now I'm lactose intolerant. Anyways, <laughs> um, too much information for the start of a podcast. So Lynette, tell me, what's the journey been like? You talked about Chicago. Um, tell me about, you know, where you grew up and like, you know, your journey towards Dubai and your journey here since I believe 2007? 2006. It? 2006. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about all of that. So born and raised in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to uni, uh, uni there, yeah. uh, to DePaul University, and then I moved to Las Vegas, Nevada. Mm -hmm. Um, and I spent about eight years there before moving to Dubai. Uh, I've been in the technology sector my entire career. So for about 30 years now, and I know I'm dating myself, but that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, so I started my first company when I was 18, yeah. I was in uni and it was a real estate, uh, uh consulting firm. Okay. Um, and uh, this was right before the dot-com boom. And I was consulting for Microsoft and at that time, Netscape, which is now Sun Microsystems. Right. Um, and I was a, a client facing consultant for them, um, working like on LDAP and Active Directory architecture and things like that. Uh, so I did technology that whole entire time. Then when I moved to Vegas, um, I've so I've had two passions, real estate and technology. So when I moved to Las Vegas, it was a property boom. And I was buying a lot of property. So buying, flipping, fixing, flipping. And I decided to get my real estate license just because I was paying a lot of broker commissions as a seller. Um, and I just want, I was just curious about it. So I got my broker's license and mm -hmm. then I took a break from technology and I went into real estate right. as a broker. Mm -hmm. uh, then within a year, I became the top 2% of uh, real estate brokers in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I opened up my own brokerage. Wow. And I did that until I moved to Dubai in 2006. Okay. Then I came to Dubai and I ran a uh, Canadian real estate brokerage for about two years. This was before Rira was established. So it was very much the wild, wild west. Mm. Um, and then at that point, uh, after the two years, I decided to take a break and start a family. I had two 
girls, two daughters, two beautiful girls okay. who are now 11 and 14. Oh. Um, and also during that time is when I decided to get into prop tech, which was okay. when I moved here to, du uh, to Dubai. Mm. Um, and the reason being was because there was a lot of gaps and obviously pain points in the market. There was no data. Mm. Uh, we didn't at that time, Property Finder was a magazine. Dubizzle is a horizontal uh, so you had cars, furniture, and a little bit of apartments and things like that. Right. Uh, Bayud at that time was non-existent. Mm. So um, I saw the gaps and I saw that there was a space, especially for real estate data. And that's when I decided to get into prop tech. Very cool. So basically from the times that Divisals was like the classified section yeah. to now what these, you know, massive prop tech companies have become. Exactly. So Something interesting that I noticed was that you also technically kind of did prop tech for a brokerage as well. Yes. Right. And set up their technology arm is what I understand. Uh, their digital transformation. Right. So what are a lot of brokerages out here missing from a technology standpoint, in your opinion? Ooh, uh, so a majority of the brokerages utilize the basic tools. So you have your CRMs right. and so forth, so on. However, they're still also uh, very spreadsheet heavy. Um, so they haven't fully gone down the route for the CRMs for all of their departments. Mm. Um, there's only a few, and it's the big few, and including the one that I was with for a year, right. uh, that fully adopted technology and wanted to integrate it into everything that they do. Yeah. Uh, there's probably like a dozen of them out there. Um, and one big thing that majority of the real estate companies didn't realize is the power in their data. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until I started building these B2B data platforms and then uh, started to work for the biggest real estate brokerage here in Dubai yeah. to showcase the data that they have available that's super powerful for the consumers and just to give the information out there in addition to the government uh, data that's available. Right. Um, so I would say that that's, that's the, the, the biggest gap as far as how the real estate agents use technology. For them, it's about selling properties and how quick they can turn over a buyer and a seller and the properties. CRM is just something that's in the way and mm. it's usually very cumbersome for the average agent to maneuver through. So it's not something that they like and enjoy and want to use. Yeah. It's only, and to, to be honest with you, it's the agents that do very, very well that know how to use the CRM systems and um, activate the various different components and be able to benefit from them. Mm -hmm. But because they're so busy, it just kind of, you know, goes yeah. past them. As long as they have their phone and their WhatsApp, they're, they're good to go. Right. Um, so and it, it, it took a very long time for agencies to really adopt technology here. Right. And like I said, there's only a very few that have pioneered it. Um, even when it came to the open data, I, the first B2B data platform that I built was in 2015, which yeah. was Property Monitor. Mm -hmm. Agents didn't get it. You mm. know, th there was a handful that got it, yeah. but majority didn't get it. It was too confusing. It was too complicated. It was just an extra step that they didn't understand the value in. And it really wasn't until COVID mm. when I was at Property Finder that they really started to embrace the data and understand the power of the data. Mm -hmm. uh, we were doing these webinars uh, during COVID when everyone was at home yeah. and we were predicting what was going to happen in the market through our through property finder search and demand data. So we were able to tell the agents, and I will never forget it because it was a pivotal point in how data was going to be used or, or how it was going to change in the agent's perspective. Yeah. And it was uh, March, April, so it was probably April, May. Within two weeks, we saw a 300% surge mm. in searches for townhouse, villa townhouse. Normally, it was for apartments, but because that's when everyone was transitioning to the mm. suburbs and they wanted the space and they wanted the villa townhouses. Right. So we were telling everyone, hey, you know, th there's something in the data, 300% surge increase in searches for this type of a property. And of course, the ones who got it ran with it have and have always done very well. Yep. But then it was the other agents who really didn't adopt data that said, huh, there's something to be had here. And now it's widely used, mm. uh, these data platforms. Do you think that every brokerage needs a chief data officer? Yes. Or chief technology officer, no. uh, officer of some kind. Absolutely. 100%. Because there's so much that can be done with technology within a brokerage yeah. that gives them that advantage, that step ahead of all the other brokerages. Absolutely. Right. 
So 13-year-old Lynette was um, working at the State Department of Education, I believe, um, yeah. working, or, you know, doing, <laughs> doing the uh, data, intern, uh, data internship, I believe. City of Chicago. City of Chicago. Sorry, I don't oh. know the, the federal infrastructure yeah. in the U.S. But yeah, um, I did my research and that's what I you know, came across. And tell me about going from that to then the Moasher, um, you know, program and like, you know, how you pioneered all of these things and opening up land department data. Those are not small feats. Mm. Those are massive and have fundamentally changed the way that people do real estate out here. It's the reason why whenever you get up on uh, camera and say, hey, Lynette Sacchetto here, real estate data queen, like, you know, everyone knows, yeah, it is the data queen, you know, listen, right? Um, in fact, I actually put it up on my story. I had, I had someone else come on the podcast and I called them the data queen and I got like totally destroyed. And I was like, wait, what? Who's, who's the data queen? And then it's, like, it's not, it's the, yeah, there we go. So um, tell me about that, right? Oh, wow. okay. So 13, mm -hmm. um, I did the Mayor Daly City of Chicago internship uh, during the summer break, summer yeah. school holidays um, at the Department of Education in the Technology Department. So like I said earlier, I have two. Pa I had two passions since I can remember, real estate and technology. Mm -hmm. And it all happened around the age of seven. So it's interesting how you said the age of seven. So uh, with real estate, it was the CEO and running my mom's apartment building at that time, which I did because right. my mom, her English wasn't very good. So mm. I was handling the tenants. And it was like my own little monopoly game. I mm. loved it. Yeah. Um, then um, at the same time, I took a programming class at my school and it was a basic pro uh, programming class. And we had Commodore 64s and they had to like tear me away from the desk because I just wanted to sit there and program, program. Mm. Um, so when I was 13... And I came from uh, the south side of Chicago. It was my only my mother. My father had passed away. So, um, and my mom, she has like a second grade education. So she was working three jobs. So we we didn't have means, right? So I had to work, uh, and I was thirteen. Uh, and the, when I saw the opportunity to work in the technology department, I just absorbed it. And uh, I remember they had these little maps, Macs with the floppy disks, and mm. they were doing design loved every part of it and that's when i knew that i wanted to get into technology business and technology mm. um so went through uni did all that came here uh, was in technology came here focused on prop tech then when i arrived i saw that there was a huge real estate data did not exist right and i realized this when i was trying to rent an apartment my mm. first apartment here in dubai so i'm like fresh off the plane <laughs> trying to understand how dubai works no and um, I was standing in this apartment, and it, this is a time where supply was very low and demand was very high. And the lady walks in, and she's like, 251 check, first person to write it gets it. I don't understand, but I, I had a conversation with her, and I said, can you tell me about the comparable date in this building? What does an apartment <laughs> like this go for? No idea what I was talking about. And it was very frustrating. Obviously, I brand new into Dubai from the U.S. I was going through a lot of learning curves. No. Um, and then that's when I decided to work with uh, the Dubai government because they are the source of truth for the data. And I knew this because of coming from the U.S. Yep. So I started working or trying to work with the Dubai Land Department. It took quite a few years. Um, we started with reports. Uh, it was a, coin, uh, a joint uh, collaboration with JLL. Yep. And then eventually got them comfortable with me and gained their trust. Um, and that's where they started allowing us to use the data. Okay, gotcha. So that was like the origin story of that yeah. piece. So endless tire, like, you know, just meetings on committees and committees. I think that's like the formula to, you know, break into the DLT kind of. Yeah, I mean, you, you it's persistence, right? If you know what you want and yeah. you have the goal and you have a solid business plan, and obviously you're showing the value to them and the value that it will bring to the Dubai real estate market. And if that's the honest intention going in, course, Dubai Land Department is going to work with you and collaborate with you. Yeah. Um, at that time, open data didn't exist. They they weren't collaborating with anyone other than ourselves and JLL. This is when I was at Property Monitor. Um, and um, uh, they they just started to give the data. We built uh, the data platform, Property Monitor. And then when I moved over to Property Finder hmm. is when we got into the partnership agreement to build Moasher. 
gotcha. the first official house price index for the city of Dubai, which was very important to them because of the JLL uh, global real estate um, report that comes out every two years. Right. Um, so every government wants to continue to improve in that report. Cool. Um, mm -hmm. And for them, they knew that if they had an official house price index for Dubai, that their ranking would improve. And sure enough, index was released. The next year, their ranking improved. They jumped so, four spots, I think. Four spots, yeah. 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 So let's talk about trends in real estate, right? So we've got all these um, stats out there about the sales prices increasing in so many areas, rental prices increasing in, I think it was Jumeirah the other day that came out as well, um, occupancy rates, all-time highs. I, I, I'm not sure what that stands at. I'll, you know, <laughs> leave it to the data expert to clarify on that. But um, what do you think are like the emerging sort of trends in real estate based on the data um, out here? So if we look at the data since COVID, so mm -hmm. COVID, we had a, a V-shaped recovery. Yeah. So everyone's like, oh, it's going to be U-shaped. No, it was V-shaped. Yeah. Um, and we have done very well, broken records month on month for the last three years, right? 100%. Um, I believe 2024 is the year of off plan. Okay. And I actually went out on, I, I submitted, I published my, port, my Q1 report today on LinkedIn okay. um, and talking about that a little bit for many reasons. Um, obviously, we have a lot of off-plan launches. I believe uh, every eight hours, there's 18 I saw launches. That, that was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and if you look at my WhatsApp, I think I get two new launches every hour and I'm connected to all the developers. Um, so it, it's incredible the amount of launches, um, but they're really good quality compared to what we had before when we had a big wave of off-plan, right? Mm. Um, also, if we look at the number of completed units for 2024, estimated, now this is estimated, so it's a very dynamic number and it depends on uh, construction um, uh, timing, it depends on the developer, it depends on when they get all of the licensing from municipality, whether it's gonna be completed this year, but set to be completed this year, we're looking at 63,000 units. Okay. And this is according to Readin which okay. is a real estate data platform here. They're the oldest one here. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at this 65,000, that's a pretty big number. Okay, yeah. let's say 40% of it comes into market. Then we're looking at all the launches that are coming to market. But one thing that I found very interesting, and this is where I love to dig into the data and find like the, the juicy stuff yeah. that people don't necessarily look for. During COVID, 43% of the off-plan projects had post handover payment plans. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are very lucrative. People love the post handover payment plans. These are where you get the property handed over and then you have three, five, seven, ten years sometimes. Yep. Imar had a 10 year plan where you can then play, pay the uh, property off and not have a mortgage. So you're paying directly to the developer. Right? right. So that means when your property gets handed over, you can rent it, get your rent rental income and still have a very decent ROI compared yep. to the payments that you're paying to the developer. Gotcha. Obviously, since COVID, actually last year, there was zero post handover payment plans because the demand was so high. Mm. However, this year, 30% of the projects set to be completed by 2026 have post handover payment plans. That's so, so cool. So this is very indicative of where the market's going to go. So what does this mean? This means that there's a lot of supply coming into the market. Mm -hmm. Developers know that a lot of supply is coming in this year, next year, and the year thereafter. Yep. And they know that they're going to have to be competitive, yep. which means we're going to have an oversupply of off-plan. Okay. that's what, And I think it's a good thing for the buyer, right? In the end, it is in because effect, it's yeah. choice. And then yeah. prices will start to correct and adjust. Yeah. Um, because if you look at the quarter-on-quarter, year-on-year increases for off-plan and for both ready or secondary market, right. I mean, it's it's significant. So year-on-year mm -hmm. increases are double digits, 15%, 20%. Mm -hmm. If you look at the off-plan market today, the price per square foot and the median sale price is higher, both of them higher, than the secondary market. So the average sales price in off-plan is 13% higher than the secondary market. Okay. Which it's we've never been in, in that direction with off-plan. It's always secondary was higher than, than the off-plan market. Now we've kind of had a shift. In Q1, 61% of the properties that were sold yep. were off-plan. So it's very interesting, the dynamics of the market. Um, and I'm tracking it, and I'm also finding yeah. some more things, but I, I'm not going to talk about it yet. But 
months to come. And I think what, uh, Q1 sales overall was up 30% this year compared to last year or something like that, was it? Uh, so if we look at quarter on quarter... I think it was Q1 2020. Uh, I, I saw it on the SPAS, um, John John's yeah, yeah. story, I think. It was something about Q1 sales being up almost 30% above 2023 Q1. Um, and I was like, wow, that's crazy. We're still going up. And to the right. Yes. However, ready, yeah. quarter on quarter, mm. so compared to last quarter, yeah. declined 6%. Right. Which is very interesting, meaning secondary property. Sure. Uh, so focus on off-plan. <laughs> I mean, it's a good market to be in as an agent, obviously. Yeah. Um, and as a buyer, it's also a good market because you have choice. Um, it's just, you know, it's your tolerance on dealing with the construction and not really knowing when it's going to be completed. Right. And I saw your Instagram reel about property inspections, oh, right? It's never the ending. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it's it's just uh, one of those things that just doesn't happen out yeah. here, right? Yeah. So why did you uh, think in that moment that like, you know, hey, I got to talk about property inspections and like, what do you think that looks like in practice in this market? So it was actually the storms mm. that made me think about it. Yes. Yeah. Because a lot of issues that properties have, uh, especially with the water that was leaking into the properties, yeah. normally would be caught in a proper property inspection. Right. Right. And it can only be caught by a certified individual who has some kind of construction or engineering background. Right. It's not going to be caught... Uh, cosmetically through like a snagging of an off-plan property, right? When it gets right. handed over. So a lot of these issues would get caught by an inspector if the property had a property inspection. Now in the U.S., for us, it's like mandatory. It's not mandatory by law, but yep. anyone buying a property, they absolutely get a property inspection. Okay. Um, here, no one thinks to do it. It doesn't even exist, to be honest with you. We don't have property inspectors here. We did some, maybe I think it was uh, 10 years ago, there was a society of property inspectors. I believe it came from the U.S., the the companies, but it doesn't exist here anymore. Mm. Um, and I think it's, it's essential because not only do they look at structural issues, they look at the piping, they look at the air conditioning, they look at uh, if there's any termites, which does exist here. Yeah. Um, if your pool is functioning, if you have a pool, if it functions. Um, and it's just a really the roof, for mm -hmm. example, yep. that's a very big issue here. Yep. Most people don't have waterproofing on the roofs. Right. It doesn't come waterproof from the developer. That would get caught and yeah. that needs to get remedied, okay. which is where a lot of problems happen during the rain. So that that's what made me think about it because one of my properties, it, it literally was raining inside the property, but from no the way. ground level. And I'm thinking like, it's not coming from the roof. So what is like, how, how could it be? No. Um, so it, it just made me think about it. So I put it out there and of course they got a lot of reaction and then people started asking me about off plan as well. Should they get a property inspection? And the answer is yes, absolutely. But we don't have, like, I wouldn't know who to call to be honest with you. Th there's clearly some room in, in the market for something so like that. So there's room for someone to come and do that. So with the storm, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people now. I think a lot of the developers have come out and said, Hey, we'll help you guys out with any, any damages, everything like that. We saw today, um, I think there was a cabinet meeting of sorts where citizens are getting uh, about uh, almost two billion dirhams worth of um, you know repairs done and things like that. Um, what should the average person, buyer, um, tenant, be asking their landlord slash agents? What are the things that we can look for as normal people? Let's say not real estate people who don't know what an real estate investment portfolio looks like anything, just home buyers, right? Yeah. Or just tenants. Um, what should they be asking their landlords and what rights do they really have in that context um, post storm? You mean the ones that were affected? Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, unless you have a contents insurance, so renter content or homeowner content insurance, yeah. there's nothing that anyone can really do for you, right? right? Because it's the contents that were damaged inside the property. Yeah. If you are a renter, obviously the owner is responsible to remedy all of the issues that happen within the property and the developers are uh, coming up and, and they're taking responsibility for some of it and, and they're offering to fix it as well. Yeah. Um, however, if you didn't have insurance, and this is another thing from the US, yeah. 
is homeowners insurance, content insurance. So when you buy a property, that's another thing that you do right away. Right. And I always got made fun of as the American because they always say you have insurance on your insurance. <laughs> it's true, but yeah. it's for, you know, situations like this. And I right. know it's not very common here culturally. Yeah. And when I say culturally, I mean Dubaian, right? Right. Um, I actually had to force myself to get the insurance here to say, hey, Lynette, hello, you always got insurance. Why wouldn't you get it here? There's nothing different. So um, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be part, become norm and education needs yeah. to really be put out there as to the importance of it. But I think the storm kind of was a very good example of why. Yeah. So yeah. if there was a checklist of things that I needed to look for for f future looking, right, in yeah. terms of like renting a home or buying a home, what should I be asking if you were to say top three things that I need to? So that's a very good question. It's actually kind of a touchy mm -hmm. s subject it, or it's going to be a touchy okay. subject okay. right because i am sure people who were looking to buy or rent property in some of the areas that were hit very hard mm -hmm. changed their minds wouldn't you yeah i mean they're I scared would. right i, I would don't. so those areas are going to be affected price wise their valuations are going to be affected mm -hmm. Um, the demand for those areas are going to be affected. And some of these areas are very high demand areas. So right. It's going to be very interesting to see the dynamics of the market as we go forward. Now, if I was looking to buy a rent as a, as a end user consumer, number one, I would have been following the news to see what areas were affected. Yeah. And number two, I would have gotten out the, the next day or whenever I could have to start scouting the areas that I was interested in to see what the damage was. Uh, I would definitely speak to a, a real estate professional um, and try to get their honest opinion about these areas that were affected. Or if I'm looking in an area where I wasn't sure if it was affected, try to yep. find out as much information about it. Um, because it's not just um, it's not just the actual unit that's affected. It's how things were constructed infrastructure wise gotcha. around these communities and master communities or within these master communities that you have no control over of. Right. So it's either the sewage or sorry, the drainage, uh, how the roads are uh, designed. You know, unfortunately, if you're parallel with 311, you're going to get flooded because there's nowhere where the rain can go unless you have this massive drainage system, which doesn't really exist here in Dubai. And, and they're it's obviously looking to fix it. Work in progress now, yeah. I mean, look, I absolutely love Dubai and they have always just... Whenever there's been an issue like this, a big issue, they come immediately and rectify it. Yep. So I know it will be rectified. It's just going to take some time. 100%. So, but if I'm looking to buy a rent now, these are definitely the things. And home insurance, content insurance. Insurance, insurance. Insurance. Yeah. Like if I yeah. was an agent today working with clients, that's, it would definitely go into my packet for them. Right. Um, that and property inspection. Okay. So... Speaking of, you know, uh, property inspections, and we, we've also spoken a lot about the data piece of real estate, something pretty huge is coming to Dubai. And we've seen this and you've been uh, championing it for quite some time as well, I believe, like, you know, speaking to all these folks and you've known about this before. I would say most of us, you know, heard about it, right? Um, the Dubai MLS mm. system. Um, yes. So tell me a little bit about what it means, right? Um a lot of people listening to this are people that trust your opinion on everything real estate, everything technology. What do you have to say to the different stakeholders in real estate about this MLS concept coming to Dubai? Obviously, people in America are used to it. People out here are not. Yes. So what should they be worried about and what are they blowing up in their minds right now that might not be as much of a worry? Yeah. Nothing to be worried about. Yeah. So whether you're a consumer or a broker, this is very welcome news. Yeah. Um, I've been uh, preaching about MLS and bringing in uh, uh, MLS here ever since the day I arrived here 18 yeah. years ago. So uh, I was so excited to hear about the news about a month ago when I was told, uh, especially that it's being powered by CoreLogic. So CoreLogic is uh, the largest real estate data company in the world. No. Um, they are based out of Australia and mm -hmm. they have headquarters all, all, all over the world. Um, so it is powered by CoreLogic and the listing platform is Matrix, which is a, one of the major listing pra uh, platforms in North America. Right. Uh, it's going to bring transparency to the market. Um, I don't have all the details yet. However, from reading the website and understanding MLS very, very well, 
uh, from the U.S., it's going to be a CRM, a B2B CRM, so where yep. brokers can list their properties or list their listings and share with other brokers, yep. which is what an MLS is. Right. Um, in the U.S., it's the authoritative listing platform. Therefore, it gets all the properties get put into the MLS, and then it feeds to the other property portals, which, from what I understand, is supposed to be the same way here. Yep. Um, but again, I don't have all the details yet. Mm -hmm. I will get them tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, and um, it's also, from my understanding, it looks like it will be a property portal as yep. well, just like it is in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the MLS feeds to Realtor.com. Realtor.com is a free real estate portal for uh, brokers to to list their listings on um, and for consumers to, to go to. Um, in the U.S. is very interesting because Brokers don't pay brokerage. So it's the broker, the agent, yep. that lists the property, not the company. Gotcha. They do not pay to list their properties mm -hmm. on any of the portals, Zillow, Trulia. Oh, why is that? Uh, why, why does the broker list and not the brokerage? Because uh, the broker is the one responsible yep. for the real estate transaction, the okay. sale, the listing. Mm. So the brokerage has a certain level of responsibility, but it is the broker that's the professional. It's the broker that gets licensed. It's the broker that goes through all the training and at the end of the day, legally, yeah. is responsible if something happens Gotcha. in, gotcha. in the U.S. Um, so uh, they don't pay to, to list their properties on the portals because it's content. And the portals absolutely love the content. They want the content to bring the B2C, the consumers, to their website. So it's going to be interesting how that's going to work here because one thing that I was reading on the website is that the MLS here is controlled by the agent and the agent controls where their listings will get distributed to. Mm. So that's a very different model than what we're used to here in Dubai. So I'm curious on how that's going to work. But at the end of the day, MLS is just going to bring transparency. Uh, I'm assuming, this is an assumption, only licensed real estate brokers can list on the MLS. Yeah, Ahmed, uh, so I, I had him on just before as well, and like he, he confirmed that it will be only licensed a agents that can be allowed to list. Also, the brokerage would need to sign on first, and then okay. everyone else at that brokerage would get access. That's okay. what I was told, at least. Yeah, I'm, look, I'm sure that they're going to have to adopt to uh, the UAE model um, in order for it to, to work here. Yeah. Uh, I'm very curious to see if it's going to bring exclusivity to the market, which is something that I've been championing. No. No? Uh, oh, the, he, he hopes it does. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you said no. Yeah. Uh, it's be, because it, yeah. It, it, it will get rid of so many issues. It would get rid of fake listings. Yeah. Um, it will make the agent more responsible and yeah. more responsive mm -hmm. to those uh, listings that they have and that they have exclusivity to. And it would just bring a better user journey throughout the real estate process for both for everyone the buyer the seller the agent right um so it's all good news it's going to bring a lot of good things to the dubai real estate market i'm so happy it's here finally and uh i'm looking forward to working with them yeah i'm super excited as well i can't wait for it it's it's like all the different technological waves sort of like coming together at yeah. once prop tech. the yeah prop tech right um we've got the next elephant in the room which is ai Right. Okay. AI, open data, like, you know, all these things are very much like in your wheelhouse. Um, and it's an overused kind of thing. I, I think the bad examples of AI being used in real estate today are uh, in a lead qualification bot where it's just kind of like, you know, just a random GPT-4 kind of responding to an average person and then just sounding robotic and the yeah. user turns kind of a thing. Um, or some chat GPT generated social media post, which never works because your authenticity doesn't come through. Um, and these are kind of the examples of how AI is being used. We um, also see there's a lot of avenues in like the AR, VR kind of space, especially uh, I wrote a small article about this when the NAR settlement came out in the US. Um, it was how are brokers just kind of going to evolve their business models yeah. or rather justify their commissions kind of a thing and offering technologically advanced kind of solutions or showing the uh, person that's selling their home that, hey, we, we are the best in the business from all different aspects on not just, you know, the brokerage and sales kind of um, standpoint, people's standpoint, but also on technology seems to be a really big, big factor. So in the context of AI, I guess, would you say it's kind of similar to uh, the technology piece we were talking about earlier? Everyone needs a CTO. Everyone needs to look at how they can leverage their data better. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, because now we're getting bombarded by AI. Right. And unless your tech 
or you love tech, so you love to play with the AI, you're going to be very confused. Yeah. And if you just take something and then you try it, it's just not going to work. With AI, I I feel or I truly believe just from my own personal experience, I do research on the various tools that I, I want to work with, depending yeah. on what I'm trying to accomplish. I test three, four, five of them. Yeah. And then once I refine it to two, then I realize, okay, these two, do they accomplish what I want to accomplish for this specific task? Because they're very task specific, right? right? You rarely find an AI tool that's going to do everything for you. And all of this takes a lot of time. And yeah. it takes the tech knowledge somewhat, but it takes really the enjoyment of working with tech. Do you enjoy playing with these tools and learning and figuring out how it's going to work for you? Real estate agents, or no. No. Right. Uh, unless they're tech savvy, tech centric, yeah. it's just it's it's very difficult for them. Imagine a world where real estate agents became developers and coders. You know, that would be crazy. <laughs> um, I can't imagine what that world would look like. Maybe like my kids generation. Yeah. They're, it, you know, by default, they have to do it yeah. in school. So yeah. maybe I, I don't know. But I, I know today. Right. It's a bit too much. And yeah. for real estate agents to try to absorb uh, it's so what I would say or what I would recommend is that in the brokerages who have these CTO uh, or chief data officers that they find the tools that's going to work for their agency and their agents and then they implement it and, and customize it for them. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, I've been given the five minute warning by Nitu, oh, so, wow. which okay. means uh, <laughs> I need to ask you two very important questions. Okay. Um, number one, what's one quote about entrepreneurship that kind of sticks with you uh, on the day to day when you're doing things? Um, you know, uh, that you just kind of carry with you or something that you tell yourself uh, about entrepreneurship because you do have your hands in a lot. So I, ca I can only imagine, you know, how you deal with all of that. Yeah. Always follow your gut. Yeah. Always. Yeah. It will never fail you, it's, it's, especially if you refine it. Sure. And then from a technical perspective, I, I, I was the one that brought it. It's not my quote, but I was the one that brought this quote to the market. Without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So if I'm struggling for something and everything is opinion based or I'm just, you know, not being fed the right information, I go straight to the data yeah. to get down to the bottom of it. The data will tell me everything, just like financials when you're building a business. If you build it out for five years, you can have all these grand dreams and think this and that. But at the end of the day, how many subscriptions? What's the bottom line going to be? No, that's great. And um, my last question to you is what advice would you give your 21 year old self? Ooh. 21, I was already in tech, had my company, I was soaring. What I would tell her is follow your gut. No. Follow it because your gut knows, your gut knows you. Because no. at that point, I was always not sure. I was young, I was 21, right? No. Um, so sometimes I followed it, sometimes I didn't. And sometimes I was too scared because the opportunities were so big that I, I was faced with at that age. Right. Um, so I would say, follow your gut, don't be scared, and just push right through it. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I, <laughs> I, well, you know, I surely hope like we advance to the point of time travel or something like that where we can actually go and tell, I don't know, uh, there's this whole thing about how you could disrupt the whole continuum if you went back and said something or something like that. I'm not quite sure I would, though. I, oh, would you not? You would not interrupt? <laughs> no, I don't yeah. think so. Not not that part. Because, okay. yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like what you would tell yourself now to your old yeah. Okay, awesome. So, Lynette, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank I really appreciate it. Yeah, it, it was amazing. And like also, I, I've learned so much about the data infrastructure of the real estate business, which, in my opinion, is the backbone of the Absolutely. industry, right? Without um, data, you're just another person with an opinion. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I need to have more data and less opinions. <laughs> That's what I've got from, the, from this uh, session. But thank you so much for coming on. Um, and to everyone listening, smash that subscribe button and we'll see you next week.